If you turn to Luke, chapter is 4. So this is when Jesus was, after Jesus immediately he was baptized, uh, and then Satan led him to be what? To be tempted, all right? And he went, he went to Nazareth. Let us um, start from verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, News of him went out throughout all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it's written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the what? To the poor. Okay? We, we, we are seeing some, some um, traditional uh, uh, um, outlining of after Jesus' uh, baptism, he's now going to preach the gospel and he's going to the poor. He has sent me to heal the what? The broken one, hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and to recover our sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable ear of the Lord. Then he closed the what? Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogues were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him, marvel at the precious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to Surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Surely I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. But I, but I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Jerusalem. I hope I'm saying that. In the, in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow, and many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. So all those in the synagogues, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. So go back to um, verse 18. Verse 18 said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to recover sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the, uns 
acceptable here of our Lord. Now, in John chapter 1, we see where Jesus started to select um, his disciples. And when he started, when he selected his disciples, Jesus were making disciples for which of the purposes? Or for what purpose? Why was to Jesus making church. this? Eh? To build his church. To build his church. Anybody else? To preach the gospel. Yeah, to preach the gospel. Anything else? The New Jerusalem, 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, disciples, mm -hmm. they represented the walls of the new temple. Okay. They represented the walls. What, anything else? So, when Jesus was making disciples, he was not just making disciples to send them out. All that you have said is correct. But when Jesus was making disciples, he was pouring into them his what? His way of life. So before they could go out and preach the gospel, before they could go out and do all of these things, they had to imitate whom? The Messiah. Okay? So to become a disciple making, all of us have to replicate and, 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 and fashion ourselves of the life of whom? Of Jesus Christ. And so in all of Jesus' encounter, Jesus was, if, if you read all of the encounters um, with Jesus and his, the 12 apostles, you read um, uh, John chapter 13, how he washes the disciples' feet and he's teaching them what it means to serve in order for you to be a master in the kingdom. You first have to be a slave in the kingdom of whom? Of God. Um, if you read uh, another encounter or teaching the disciples how they must have faith in the almighty God. Teaching them how they should nurture regardless. Nurturing and caring regardless of 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 why are, are, are the crowd's <coughs> expectation. So even though the crowd is some of them who are in the crowd are there for fish and bread, you should still what? Teach the gospel. You should still feed them regardless of their ulterior what? motives. So he was instilling in them his way of life, the way how he functioned, the way how he views people, um, humility, he taught them humility. Uh, uh, um, um, he taught them how to serve the poor and how to care for those who were oppressed. So, so, so before he sent them out, he spent quality what? Time with them. Quality time teaching them, even though they had the system of the Old Testament. Even though they were engaged with some spiritual form of things, Jesus came and brought quality life, not quantity, quantity life, quality life, a spiritual life that reflects him. Now, he, 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 as I said in his inaugurational speech in Matthew chapter um, 5, 6, and 7, and 8, uh, we see how Jesus said, well, you used to hear of the olden times that you know, um, you used to do this, an eye for an eye. But I tell you now, if anyone smack you on one cheek, turn the one, the other cheek. So Jesus is saying, and Jesus is saying, we are the salt of the what? The earth. We must act different. We must speak different. We must love different. We must share differently. That because Christ brings an illumination. Christ brings a light that is different and separate from the world.
So we as disciples, uh, as uh, we are going to be disciples makers, and we are turning ourselves into disciple makers, we must follow Jesus. We must be the disciple that we saw in the way how Jesus talked, the way how he act, and the way how he shared um, when he was on the big one. Any question? You understand that aspect? So before Jesus turned the disciples what loose, huh? Before Jesus turned the disciples loose, before he said to them, go in all the world, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. Go, before he said, go in all the world and make disciples, he first turned them into a product of what? A disciple maker. He first did that. In John chapter 20, you remember when Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than what? These? Hello? You remember that text? Anybody remember what, what I'm talking about? He said to Peter how many times? How many times did he say to Peter? Can anybody remember? <clears throat> it's St. John chapter 21, I'm sorry. St. John chapter 21. Because what happened when Jesus died? What happened? What happened when Jesus died? They went back to their what? There was a great earthquake. No. When, what, what, what did the disciples do when Jesus died? They went back to their fishing. Right? Not on the cross, but the disciples that Jesus that were following Jesus. When Jesus died, they went back to fishing. They went back to physical fishing when Jesus called them from fishing to fishing from what? Of men. So it seems like they still did not understand that Jesus was going to get up what? Get up again. And so when Jesus met um, Peter, because remember it was Peter whom Jesus gave the keys to. He was going to preach on the day of Pentecost. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they say, some say that you are what, Jeremiah or some other prophet. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? He's speaking to the disciples. And it was Peter, he said, you are the Christ. And then Jonah said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto me, but my father who is in heaven. And based on this confession, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and, and, and you and gates and he said the gates of hell will not prevail against this. He said upon this by this confession, upon this confession I will build my ecclesia, my church. So it was Peter in John now. He's saying to Peter in St. John chapter is St. John chapter 21. Verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend to my sheep. And the people of the world, he, Jesus Christ, is saying they are his sheep. <coughs> and he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? I don't know if there is any parallel to which Peter denied three times. 
I don't know if there's a parallel to that. You remember Peter was cussing and saying, I don't know you just before Jesus was crucified. When they point out, he said, you are one of him, his disciple. And he was quarreling. But here, Peter, Jesus is saying, listen, <coughs> you were called for a purpose, called to a purpose, and I need you to now take up that mantle. And so throughout the time of Jesus calling Peter, Andrew, and all of the apostles, Jesus was turning them into disciples and disciple makers. That's what he was doing. And so when he turned them loose, and when he ascended into heaven, eh, they got it. They were reflecting whom? Jesus Christ. To the point that in Acts uh, chapter 2 and verse, no, before that, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, um, he said to his apostles that they should wait at Jerusalem. Uh, verse 8, where they're going to receive power from an eye. And so in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up, uh, verse 11, with the eleven, and he started to what? To preach. Down in Samaria, it was Peter again. He preached. In Acts chapter 10, it, um, with Cornelius and his household, it was Peter again preaching. And Cornelius was a Gentile. But even before that, when they were beaten, that flog, in Acts chapter 3, Peter said we ought to obey what? God rather than what? Man. If Jesus had not prepared Peter for that moment, what kind of uh, action do you think Peter would have taken? If God wasn't preparing them, if Jesus wasn't instilling some values, some spiritual values, into them when they are encounter certain things. Who was locked up in prison? It was Paul and Silas. And they are great apostles and disciples. But I'm making the point, the point that I'm making is church, this book is just a guide. It's just going to be a guide to turn us to let us look to Jesus, to emulate Jesus and follow his principle so that when we are making disciples, we understand, uh, you know, when, when Peter and the other apostles, they encounter trials and tribulation because of that prep, preparation stage, that preparatory stage, I'm making up a word, that, that, that shaping stage and molding stage. They looked to Jesus, they were reflecting Jesus, and they saw how Jesus was nurturing, and they saw how Jesus was caring, they saw how Jesus moved with the people. Um, he went to Matthew's house, he went to um, Zacchaeus' house, and he ate, and he taught, and he was patient. They observed all of Jesus' actions. And they become the disciple Jesus wanted them to become. And so this is going to take uh, prayer. This is going to take, because Jesus, he went and he prayed. He took some of his disciples with him. And even when they retired, you know, he, he was still praying in dire circumstances. And he was still teaching. They observed him dying on a cross and the way how he act in his time of adversities and trials and tribulation. And so once we uh, would have observed, once we would have uh, uh, inhaled and embraced the way how Jesus lived, and his encounter and the way how he 
dealt with situation and we absorbed all of this and applied to our lives, church, we will be able to nurture others to whom? To Christ. So we are reflecting Christ. We are illuminating Christ. We are imitating Christ. And when we are doing this and making disciples, it is this Holy Spirit is going to allow Christ to be seen to do, to be seen um, by those whom we are attending to, or we are making disciples of, <laughs> or turning them into disciple makers. You understand what I'm saying, Church? Does that make sense? Do you see that in the in the life of Jesus Christ? What I see in the life of Jesus is his strict obedience to Moses. And that is what made him who he is. And he told his disciples to also obey Moses. And Moses is the covenant that he lived. He did not bring a new I, I would have would have to have a discussion with you on that. I'm sure you will. Um, uh, I don't want to get into a debate on what God says, but Jesus um, in John chapter 1, uh, uh, it said that uh, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Also, the gospel was preached before Moses to Abraham, and so we can have a discussion on that. But here, I'm presenting to you not uh, Moses, not the law, I'm presenting to you Jesus Christ. I'm presenting to you how Jesus was the question. Then, yeah. If Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses, mm -hmm. how did Jesus live? Okay, as I said, that is a different study all by itself. We're going to look on fulfillment. We got to look on uh, what law are you making reference to? Uh, as to the Pentateuch. Okay? So, I am here challenging us, Luke and Jesus Christ, if the law came by Moses and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, who is superior to the law, which the Bible says. So, here I am making a claim, and not just making a claim, it's a factual claim from the book, that it is Christ in whom we dwell. It is Christ in whom we have our have our being. And so we must look to Jesus Christ because he is the perfection of what? Everything on this earth. The perfection of the law. That's right. The perfection yeah. of the law. So how did he live? So he lived up by grace and, and truth. Eh? He lived according to the law. Now when he obeyed the law, and as I said, you're taking the, um, the, the class into a, a different direction. When Jesus died, there were no more uh, law of Moses. And that is why we would have to go into Hebrews chapter 8 and see what does it, the new covenant and all of these things yeah. refers to. All right? In um, Jeremiah 30, is it 31 or 34? I'm not even. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, we can explore that, but that is a different study all beside itself. Here I'm talking about how Jesus lived and how we, he taught his disciples how to live and how when making disciples, Jesus instilled his life in them, the way how he acted, the way how he spoke. And so for us to make disciples, or make disciples, we must emulate Christ 
and instill the same things that Jesus instilled in the apostles with those who we are making disciples. Yes. So what did he instill in the apostles? His lifestyle. Which was? Which was? His life, his examples. Which was? Which was what? Following the law. If he didn't follow the law, his community and, the, and everyone in it would have seen that he was a false prophet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you are on two different pages. I'm on the whole page of the whole book. No. Following China. what law? Are you talking about the Ten Commandments? Hold on. Are you talking about the Ten Commandments? So, so everyone has a question of the life and teachings of Jesus. That's okay. why there's a class on it at Harvard. Yes. The most important thing that every student can observe is that Jesus lived the law of Moses. Huh? Go ahead. Because he was under, when he was alive, he was under the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was under it. Yeah. But yeah. we are not. Yeah. I'm not suggesting we have to be. I'm yeah. saying that the way that Jesus lived. So are you telling me that you're, you're, um, today you are uh, obeying the 613 laws in the Old Testament? Are you no, telling I'm saying me? that today Jesus is my atonement and I no longer have to slaughter animals. And I'm saying that today mm -hmm. I take a stand to worship the Lord in the wilderness according to his testament, which is given to Moses. I'm saying that today, mm -hmm. Jesus is the atonement of my sin. Right. I'm my high priest. And mm -hmm. I'm saying that today, I am faithful to the first covenant, which is the new covenant fulfilled. You're faithful to the first? You were faithful to the first? So what happened to the second? So like, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. So, hold on. The Bible, does the Bible talk about two covenants? The Bible talks about one covenant. No, hold on. Does the Hebrew Bible talks about two covenants? The Bible talks about one covenant and how it was broken. And then how it was fulfilled. And then how it was fulfilled. Does the Bible <coughs> talks about a first and a second covenant in Hebrews chapter 8? Yes or no? In your logic, it's linear and there are two. In, in God's time, it's I'm asking a direct question, Shane. Does the Bible talks about two different covenants? No, it talks about one covenant. In chapter 8. It talks about one covenant. And <coughs> in chapter 8. It filled it. In and chapter 8. It said that the first all, covenant had been perfect. Hebrews. <coughs> Here's a passage from Hebrews 7, mm -hmm. verse 18. Mm -hmm. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest and an, with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Mm -hmm. A covenant that is the one covenant fulfilled. Because, that, because the old okay, covenant... Okay, so we will... Listen, we will have... We can have a discussion on that. Do we live in a lawless world? No, Shane, we can have a discussion on that. Why this, do we live in a lawless world? No, we, we can have a discussion on that another time because it's going into a different direction, if you're honest, a different study. So we can have that. But my main, the, the, the trust of this is we, have to make, we are going to make disciples, but first Christ make disciples. And the way how we make disciples, we look to his life and teachings we look to the way how he lived and the way how after his death and resurrection, the way how the apostles lived. And they emulate his life and by emulating his life and following his example, that's what they went out and taught in the world. And so we are going to be able to look to Jesus and first transform our lives in order to, 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 to impact others um, around us. All right? All right, um, we went over a little bit, but that's it. <coughs> Thank you for your time and your participation. God bless you.